for allowing us to come now into this committee hearing, and we ask you to allow us to do what's best for the people of this great state. Give us the wisdom that we need to uh, to represent uh, our constituents in our state and our house the way we should. These blessings we ask in your name. Amen. All righty. Uh, the first thing on our agenda today will be to look at the rules that you have in your folder. These are the same rules um, that we had in the past. The chair would be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any questions about the uh, committee rules. If no one has any questions, the chair would accept a motion to approve the rules. There is a motion in the second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Now we have rules so we can operate. Thank you. All right, next, uh, let's do some introductions. Um, we have um, some new members of the committee that are here today. Several folks are at the mandatory training today and couldn't be here, so we're missing a couple of folks. But it has long been the, um, the tradition of this committee at the beginning of every uh, new session that the youngest and the newest member uh, and um, Representative Walensky, I believe that's you, regales us with a version of their alma mater. <laughs> and it can, it can be your college or law school. It doesn't matter which one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Press this, press this button. Which one is it? Number seven? Okay. You don't know it by heart? Miss Oliver, you didn't talk to him about this? I, I'm new to the committee, and yeah. I would love the opportunity to. Uh, I'm new, and I would love the opportunity right now, and I'm ready. I mean, I am. I, am, I mean, it's on the tip of my tongue right now. The gentleman is not recognized for that purpose. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll 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 take a break with Representative Walensky, who is obviously not prepared, Miss Oliver. I'm I'm disappointed. You said high, you had high hopes for this young man. So, okay, okay. All right. Well, we'll. Well, now that that's a good music. There we go. Yeah, yeah. That's better. All right. Well, he's getting better. He's getting better. All right. We uh we do welcome all the new members on the committee. Um, let's just go down the list. Representative Bruce is not with us today, but Representative Bruce has been on this committee since 2002, I believe, uh, when he and I were first elected. Representative F. Stration, you are new to the committee, although you've been down here numerous times. And just tell us what your district is and tell us where your law practice is. Chairman, Press your button there and I'll turn your mic on. Is it flashing? Are you number 13, maybe? Not working? All right. Press that one. Okay, there you go. And, and next is Representative Todd Jones, who is new to our committee. And let's see, is it working? No, oh, there we go. Okay, there we go now. Now try it. All right. And also our vice chairman, Todd. Well, first and foremost, I think I need to thank the chairman uh, for outing me. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of you found out probably only within the last month that I'm an attorney, and I've been one since 1994. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Looking forward to your leadership. Um, I'm in-house counsel and have been uh, since 1994. Uh, so I think I can bring that type of perspective in terms of who I represent. I represent South Forsyth County and North Fulton in District 25. Thank you, Representative Jones. Ms. Oliver, you may be the longest serving member of the legislature that's on our committee. Would that, would that be correct? Which number are you there? Press your button. Depends on whether you count the Senate in that crowd or not. Like Today we will talk about the Senate. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Both uh, Speaker Ralston and I both were in the Senate for six years, so we add our uh, on the same committee, the Judiciary Committee and the Senate together for six years. So we add those years together. I may be the longest serving if we don't count your internship year back when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would have you beat there maybe if we count if we counted when I was an intern in 1986. So, um, all right, Miss Oliver. Uh, and next, does anybody know who this guy is right here? Uh, what, what's your number, sir? Introduce yourself to us so we'll know who you are. 
Well, before I do that, um, I'm wondering if this is going to become a singing committee <laughs> if it's too late for us to get Wendell back. <laughs> Everybody can sing but Representative Reeves. <laughs> uh, we're chairman of the Rules Committee, Mr. District Mr. Powell. District 171 down in southwest Georgia where they did not have snow today. Did not have snow today. Well, All gosh, right. they didn't have snow in Atlanta either, did they? No, I didn't. I heard they did in Blue Ridge. I heard on the radio this morning they had a little bit up there. So, All right, uh, Mr. Whip, will you number 12? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Trey Kelly, represent House District 16, all of Polk County, a part of Harrelson County, part of Bartow County. Honored to uh, get to serve here with you, Mr. Chairman. All righty, and we'll skip uh, our attorney right now and go to Miss Rich. Miss Rich, press your button there and we'll recognize you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am Bonnie Rich, and I represent House District 97, which includes Duluth, Swanee, and Sugar Hill. And I have my law practice in Duluth and Swanee. All right. Mr. Wilson, are you next? Oh, no, Mr. Reeves. Okay, let's see here. Number seven. All right. Well, if I can't sing, then uh, the my name is start. my name is Bert yeah. Reeves, and I am a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech, and a heck of an engineer. I, <laughs> I didn't sing it. Um, thank you for letting me on your committee. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised you did, but I'm very excited to be here serving on the Judiciary Committee. So, mm -hmm. I represent you. District 34, which is Marietta and Kennesaw and Cobb County, and I've been an attorney since 2005. And Representative Reeves is also one of the governor's floor leaders. So. We appreciate him being here. All right, one of our new members, Representative Wilson. Good afternoon, everybody. Matthew Wilson from House District 80. Covers uh, the vast majority of Brookhaven, uh, some Sandy Springs, Shambly, Dunwoody, City of Atlanta, um, Fulton and DeKalb counties. Proud to be here. All right. Uh, Representative Walensky. Uh, turn the pressure mic there. Press the little button and it'll, there you go. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Representative Mike Walensky, House District 79. Uh, I'm a fully DeKalb County district, the northwest corner. Uh, I've spent six years before this on the side helping organizations a lot in this committee with watching Wendell Willard be the chairman. So that was a pleasure and I'm very honored and excited to uh, serve with you, Chairman. So thank you. All right, Judge, press that button right there in front of you. Thank you, Mr. All Chair. Right. Is it on? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, House District 14, uh, which covers Bartow County and a portion of Floyd County, which is Carterville and Rome, along with Trey. We served together in Bartow County. Um, was probate judge here in Bartow County for 28 years. Um, happy to be a representative and happy to serve on this committee. Thank you very much. And, Judge, tell us how long you were judge of the probate court. 28 years. 28 years. Yes, wow, that's, uh, that's seven terms. Seven terms. Okay, well, good. Un unopposed. Well, we, we un <laughs> well, there you go. That's, there's two ways to run, scared and unopposed. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. So, uh, well, but we appreciate you being here and look forward to your service. Uh, Glad we, to be here. There's not a session that goes by that we don't have one, two, or three probate judges, uh, excuse right. me, probate bills right. that come through here. And uh, your knowledge will be invaluable to us, and we appreciate that. Thank you so much. So Representative Dale Rutledge, uh, like I said, several people had to be out for a mandatory training video that they didn't get at Biennial. Um, Representative Dale Rutledge has been uh, on our committee. Um, uh, Dale is, um, is not an attorney, and, and we're tr still trying to figure out what he did wrong to be sentenced to the committee for 16 years. But it's been a while since uh, Dale's been on the committee, maybe not quite that long. Representative Deborah Silcox is one of our new uh, members of the, of the committee. Um, uh, Representative Andy Welch, I think, has been on the committee probably for 10 or 12 years, uh, practices of law down in Henry County. Representative Scott Holcomb also has been on the committee probably, what, about eight years maybe? And uh, and he sent his regrets that he couldn't be here. And also, Representative Pam Stevenson has probably been on the committee at least for about 16 or 18 years, I would say. And she's also from uh, DeKalb County, I think, or is she Rockdale? DeKalb, as well as Representative uh, Scott Holcomb is. So, and then also Representative Randy Nix is, is well, Chairman Nix uh, joined us here. Representative Nix. Yes, I'm Randy Nix. I've got uh, D District 69, Trick Perry, and Carroll Counties. My son's an attorney. I suppose as close as I can get. <laughs> and I you're, served, you're a pastor and you let him become yeah, an attorney? Yeah. Okay. I, I served four years uh, on this committee. 
reluctantly. <laughs> I begged and begged to get off. Then when I became ethics chairman, they didn't tell me until after I'd already taken the position that ex officio put me back on. So mm -hmm. I learned yesterday what ex officio means, though. That mm -hmm. just means you call me when you need a quorum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's one reason. That, that may be <laughs> when you see me. <laughs> we, we might need you to lead prayer. <laughs> we, we can do that. We can do that. All right. All Thank right. you. Good to have you here, Mr. Chairman. Um, all right. And so now I want to make sure everybody knows the people who really make this place work. And uh, those are our staff members. Uh, Jordan, uh, turn your mic on there. Um, Jordan Reed is our staff attorney for judiciary and has a world of experience, and I'm very happy to have him. Jordan, uh, tell us um, your, uh, your law school background and how long you've been with the committee. Um, I also went to Georgia Tech, like Cinder Reeves, but not an engineer. Went to law school uh, with the whip. Uh, and um, I've and I've uh, been, uh, this will be my fifth session overall. Fourth is the attorney for the committee. And members, those of you returning already know this, but the new ones is I depend on Jordan to tell me all kind of stuff about the bills that you're interested in. So if you can't ever see me, which I hope you can whenever you want to, always feel free to talk to Jordan because he and I communicate quite regularly about uh, the bills and what we do down here. Now, the lady that is all our boss, uh, Jerry, Jerry, wave your hand over there. Jerry, how long have you been secretary for the committee now? Since 2013. 2013. So if you really want something done, you just ask Jerry for permission, and, uh, and it'll be okay. But she takes care of us all down here, and we appreciate that. Um, Griffin Bell is one of our legal externs. Griffin, wave your hand. Uh, Griffin is a third-year law student at uh, Mercer uh, and also from Thomaston. Thomasville, Thomasville, Georgia. He hadn't invited me to his house yet down there yet, so uh, I, um, I, I don't have the town right. I apologize, but uh, invitation will be coming. Griffin helped me last year as a second-year law student, did an externship, and he's going to be helping uh, me as well this year, and we appreciate him being here. Uh, also, er uh, Eric Arpert. Is it Eric, did I pronounce it right? Eric is a second-year second year at Emory, right? Uh, an undergraduate was... George Washington University. He's a second year uh, at Emory Law School, and he'll be with us on at least Mondays and Tuesdays, correct? We have a, another um, a law student, um, Michaela King. Uh, she is with John Marshall in her third year. Uh, she's coming on Wednesdays and Thursdays, uh, at least. She'll be here then, uh, and, um, and you'll get to see her on our Thursday meetings, um, uh, most likely. Um, now, Michaela, I've, I've enjoyed meeting her. I'm sure you will, uh, in spite of the fact that she used to work for Justice Ellington. Uh, she is an incredible person, and uh, y'all please tell Justice Ellington that we mentioned that about him when he, when he was down here. No, we're looking forward to having her. Um, and then uh, Kayla Mitchell. Kayla, is Kayla? Is she already gone for the day? She is not here today. She's not here today. Okay. Kayla is our intern, so she is still a college student at West Georgia. And she comes to visit with us from Carrollton every day. And, uh, and Kayla has the job that uh, I had in 1986 when I was an intern uh, for this uh, committee. So um, we look forward to seeing Kayla. Uh, did I miss anybody, Jordan? No. You know, if I make a mistake, it's your fault, right? right. You know that, okay, yeah. just like last year. All right. So uh, uh, we also today, as we usually do, we have some judges with us, and I want to uh, recognize them. Um, we normally have Superior Court judges, um, uh, committee members uh, come visit with us uh, uh, on a regular basis and they're a big help to us when we have our deliberations. They don't normally comment on policy issues but they do help us with procedure issues which is a lot of what we deal with here and it's invaluable. Today we have uh, two judges from Gwinnett, Judge Hutchinson and Judge Connor. Mr. Estration, you want to introduce them to us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have our Chief Superior Court Judge George Hutchinson with us and uh, the immediate past Chief Sp Superior Court Judge Melody Snell Connor with us today. If y'all could join me in recognizing them. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for coming. And then from the Griffin Circuit, I believe we have Judge Edwards here. Is that correct, Judge Edwards? Good to have you here. You got a little item on the agenda as well as some of our Gwinnett County Superior Court judges. We appreciate you being here with us today. Okay, and, um, and I also want to introduce uh, Julius, Julius Talbert. 
Juice is with the Legislative Council uh, up on the fourth floor, third floor, uh, and uh, and he is um, uh, with us uh, almost every meeting we have in Judiciary. Um, many of the bills that come through this committee, Julia straws up, and he does a good job for us, and he's here also to keep us straight. So amongst all these lawyers, we might get something right this session, I think. So Julia, thank you for all the work you do for us. All right, the first thing uh, uh, that I want to go to on the agenda is the proposed rules of the Office of State Administrative Hearings. Um, I'm glad um, uh, Chairman uh, Powell can be with us today because he can shed a little light on this. Um, because we have so many new members of the committee, uh, this is something that we're not going to take action on today, I don't think, but I wanted you to understand one of our responsibilities. Um, uh, Jordan, why don't you start out by explaining to us um, the Administrative Procedures Act and the Legislative Committee's responsibilities <laughs> when the executive agencies adopt different rules and regulations, and then you can tell us what this is. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, currently, under our code, it requires that the executive branch agencies transmit a notice of adoption, amendment, or repeal of any rule to the General Assembly, specifically through the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, any objection to the rule by a standing committee must be issued by the committee prior to the agency's intended action being taken, or they can do it by resolu resolution thereafter. The amount of time to issue an objection before the rule goes into effect is approximately 30 days. The timing is approximate because under our code, it provides that the agency needs to transmit the notice to the Office of Legislative Counsel at least 30 days prior to the date of the agency's action to be taken. And that legislative council, within three days thereof, transmitted the notice to the committee. So there could be shorter than 30 days. Um, further, within our code, it says if a standing committee to which a notice is assigned filed, and I'm paraphrasing these things, files an objection to a proposed rule, and the agency ignores the objection from the committee and adopts the proposed rule anyway, then the rule may be considered for to be overridden by resolution of the branch of the General Assembly whose committee um, adopted the objection. In the event that the resolution is adopted by such branch of the General Assembly is immediately transmitted to the other branch, meaning that if the House objects, then it is immediately the resolution is immediately transmitted to the Senate for them to either pass or not. Um, if the resolution is adopted by two-thirds of the vote by each branch of the General Assembly, then that rule in question shall be void. It doesn't go to the governor. In the event that the resolution is ratified by less than two-thirds of either branch, then the resolution is transmitted to the governor for his or her approval or veto. In the event of the governor's veto, the rule in question will remain in effect. In the event of the governor's approval, the agency rule in question will be void, meaning the governor approves the resolution that does not agree with the rule. Um, if each standing committee in the House and Senate to which a notice is assigned files an objection to a proposed rule by a two-thirds vote of the members of the committee who were voting members on the 10th day of the current session, then the effectiveness of the agency's rule in question will be delayed until the next legislative session, at which time the agency rule may be considered for override by a resolution introduced by either branch of the General Assembly. If the resolution is adopted by two thirds of the vote of each branch, then the agency rule in question is also, as discussed earlier, void. Um, and if the in the event the resolution is ratified by less than two-thirds, again, it goes to the governor, and then the same process for overriding the veto. Now, now, that's a mouthful to basically say that the, what we're talking about now is part of our oversight responsibility as a legislature when it comes to administrative agencies and the like adopting certain rules. We as a legislature basically have the power to begin a process uh, that can stay uh, those rules that were adopted, and then if both the... Uh, houses act, and I think including the governor, um, then um, possibly we can um, overturn uh, or keep from going into effect if the agency doesn't make the changes that we think are, are, um, are needed. Um, this process is not used very often. However, when it does, it can be very important for us. And it's just one of those things that as chairman of this committee, I got notice uh, that, um, that some uh, rules had been adopted. Um, and in a second, I'm going to ask Jay Powell to briefly tell us about something he did as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee uh, on the same subject, and, and action was taken, I believe, uh, and changes were made. But we adopted a bill in the legislature last year? 
Yes. Yeah. Go ahead and tell us what what that was, and then tell us what um, notice that I received of an agency action because of that. So, Mr. Chairman, are you talking about the bill as it passed by the chambers, or as it came the out of the passed, judiciary? Well, the well, the bill passed by the chamber, and then what the okay. agency did in response so to that. The version of the bill that came out of the judiciary made it where the this effectively our current rulemaking process creates a legislative veto, which means that the legislature can avoid it going to the governor, which is problematic because you can't actually do a legislative veto. So well, I'm talking about the, these rules were adopted based upon a bill that we passed that gave. This oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the bill that we passed dealt with the um, office of administrative hearing officers, if I'm saying that right their ability to have the superior court enforce um, contempt orders as well as their ability to have um, an appeal go to superior court. And I think these were judges that do administrative law hearings. Uh, and one of the problems that they were having, these are basically court proceedings of a nature. And usually they run smoothly like top most court, but occasionally they would need to enforce contempt proceedings. And it was a little arduous that they would have to go to the superior court to get that done, and so the legislature, at their request, passed a bill giving them the power to enforce contempt orders. Is that correct? And now they've adopted rules to deal with that. Uh, Did I get that wrong? Sort of. The superior court still does the enforcement. It just makes it clear that while they may issue the order, it's going to be the superior court that has okay. the ability to do it. It also provides the way to appeal to superior court, and so these rules provide the format by which you do the appeal. Um. There was an example of this where a legislative committee did act, uh, and that was Ways and Means Committee. Mr. Chairman, would you tell us briefly a, a, about that? You know, different different subject matter, but none the same procedure. Yeah, we had we actually had a bill in Ways and Means a couple of years ago that that provided for a statewide lien registry. The idea being. <laughs> that the Department of Revenue could post its liens instead of having to file a FIFA in each county in the state or in each county where they suspected the uh, taxpayer may own property. They could file one uh, statewide registry and it was done on the clerk's authority website. And that uh, then anybody that was checking a title or doing anything like that could uh, look at this website, see if there were any liens, and a lien filed in that one site would act throughout the state of Georgia. And you could pay them off, and you could get payoff figures, and I mean, it was so, supposed to streamline the process. Unfortunately, the department took the position that you had to get a clearance letter from the department before you could uh, actually close a transaction or record a deed, which basically gave the department the ability to uh, say no to any filing or you getting a clearance letter even on uh, documents that didn't transfer title such as quick claim deeds things that were boundary lines agreements all of that stuff it uh, upset the uh, real estate bar somewhat title companies everybody mm -hmm. and uh, so we uh, gave notice and uh, it actually happened in the uh, a period of time between legislative sessions so it was a little bit more cumbersome than what you're faced with now because we actually had to call a joint meeting of the Senate Finance and the Ways and Means Committee come to Atlanta or either have a telephone conference and uh, by vote basically object to the rules and suspend any action on those rules before they went into effect. And so that's an example of where you actually took action and stated a rule. And I think the agency made some adjustments, or did we actually? We, yeah, did we? They, they, well, they actually um, changed the rules up until the legislature could meet, and then we amended the law to make it clear that, that you did not have to get a clearance letter from the Department of Revenue. Right. So, so that's an example of where a committee had to meet and had to take action. Uh, as I mentioned when I started, I have no intention for us to act on this because I think the rules that have been adopted are, are, are just fine because they pretty much mirror the statute, as I can tell. Ms. Oliver? I remember the uh, OSHA bill, Office of State Hearings bill, and, and the policies behind that. I used to be a hearing officer under mm -hmm. that entity, so I was following it. What I'm trying to figure out is what's new in anything we're talking about now. Well, I actually think I have, we have a couple of people here that might be able to help explain that to us. Yeah. 
but because go ahead. in it, it's uh, the time I was a chair, the time that I've been on committees, it's always seemed to me to be a little inconsistent as to what notices I as a chair got and in relation to what agencies were sent to what committees. And I just wondered if that's been I think it, I think it's statutory, Julius. And I, and I think the, the notice actually goes to the Legislative Council first, and then they transmit it to the chairman of the whatever committee that uh, has oversight. Does the rule, and I haven't looked at this in a while, does somewhere is it written down as to what committee the Legislative Council sends what? Julius, press your, um, one of the buttons over there, and I'll turn your mic on. Okay. <laughs> I haven't I haven't looked at this recently, but I think it's based upon the, the speaker. Um, they de determine which committee has oversight over which area. I think that's the that's the because I think, I it, I think it may go to the committee that actually passed the legislation that rules are being uh, yeah. introduced to uh, interpret. Okay. So right, it, it, goes, it goes to the committee from which the bill at issue or the resolution came out of, or um, it, it can go by topic of interest from speakers up, but it really it goes to the chairman of the committee. That's by statute. And you can also just have a standing request to the Office of Legislative Council, and they can let you know. Representative Oliver. So any bill that judiciary passes, whether it's a defects bill or a family <coughs> law bill, uh, would come back the rule from whatever agency is doing whatever determination by rule would come back to us and we you I guess it'd be you not we could request hypothetically if you wanted to I want to see all file rules right and I think that, that's, that's and and that is written down in statute and somewhere else about the speaker's determination I, I am not sure on that I, I, I mean I will have to look real real quick to Okay. Any other questions? Jordan, do we have a couple of folks here today that could tell us what rules were enacted? Who? Come on up. Come on up right up here. And uh, good to have you. Please introduce yourself. I'm going to see if I can turn the mic on over there for you. And, uh, and all I'm looking for is just a brief explanation of what was done here so we can educate the committee members. Okay. Pull that microphone over to you right there. Mm -hmm. Good, good afternoon. Thank you for having us. My name is Lisa Boggs. I'm the Chief of Staff and General Counsel with the Office of State Administrative Hearings. I'm Dominic Caprero. I'm Deputy General Counsel at Office of State Administrative Hearings. And I'm Anna Kennedy, an Administrative Law Judge at OSA. Um, so just to, to start out, to give you just a very brief background, um, you're probably already familiar, or maybe not so much, with the Office of State Administrative Hearings. Um, the brief description is it's a central panel of administrative law judges that hear a variety of disputes between various state agencies and members of the public. Not every um, administrative hearing goes to OSA. For example, a workers' comp has its own <coughs> hearing division, but uh, it runs the gamut from uh, disputes with the Department of Driver Services with license suspensions to um, Department of Natural Resources to DCH to public assistance benefits with DHS, um, so on and so forth. Um, the rule, pr proposed rules um, that were submitted to Legislative Council, um, I believe earlier this month, um, arise from legislation uh, that was passed last session, um, HP 790. Uh, HP 790 um, originally uh, started from Governor Deal's Court Reform Council, um, which proposed some changes to the Georgia Administrative Procedure Act. Um, and then that bill was passed, and so these rules uh, reflect those changes with some cleanup as well, mainly um, revising some um, statutory uh, references that were out of date. Mm. Okay. So I just want to give you a brief explanation of um, uh, part of the function of this committee. And there was an explanation of what we're, um, I'm going to ask you not to take any action on, because I think it makes sense. But uh, any questions from any of the committee members about that? Anything else? No, but um, if there's anything, any other questions, you're 
feel free to to call me and call sure. our office. Um, myself and Dominic would be happy to to assist. Well, we appreciate y'all being here today, and we thank you for coming over. All right, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, appreciate y'all allowing us to uh, discuss that. Uh, next, why don't we start with uh, Miss Mathiax Bill, HB 28. You want to come on up, Representative? Bring anybody with you you like, your judges or other folks? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do mm -hmm. have my um, Superior Court Judge, please. Chief Justice, with me today. And please, please bring the judge up. Sure, seat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Representative uh, Pullen is also one of our sponsors. Thank you and Ken, you want to sit up here? I'm good here. Okay. <laughs> 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 we can still ask you questions from there, so, all right. <laughs> Good to have you with us today. Please thank tell us about HB 28. Okay, thank you, everybody, for having us here today. I appreciate it, especially Mr. Chair. In August of 18, the um, Judicial Council of Georgia approved each of two um, circuits in the Griffin Judicial Circuit and the Gwinnett Ju Judicial Circuit for additional um, judgeships. At that meeting, Chief Judge Melody Snell Connor of Gwinnett's Judicial Circuit advised that the council, the Judicial Council, that the judges of the Gwinnett Judicial Circuit unanimously ah, agreed that the Griffin Judicial Circuit had the greatest need for new judgeships. Therefore, the Judicial Council voted that our circuit would have first priority for that legislative grant and for that new judgeship. Um, there, there's some documentation that we can provide for you from Chief Justice Melton's court if you would like that. Um, with the four judges in our circuit, the Administrative Office of the Courts and the Judicial um, Council that we require that we do work, that they do work of 5.3 judges in order to qualify for an additional judgeship. Um, I'm going to allow, um, I'm going to ask Judge um, Edwards to be able to help with some of those statistics because that's his, Sorry, his, um, thank you. Pray be in. Thank you. Judge, good to have you with us here thank today. You. today. Thank you. Yeah. Chairman thank Fleming, you. Uh, Vice Chair Jones, uh, Your Honor, and uh, members of the committee, I'm Chris Edwards. I'm the Chief Judge of the Griffin Judicial Circuit, which is four counties, not one. It's Fayette, Spalding, Pike, and Upson. So if you can imagine uh, from Peachtree City uh, or Tyrone all the way down to Thomaston, uh, we have four judges in the Griffin Circuit, and I've uh, provided you with a handout that describes our need. To sum it up, we have a letter from Chief Justice Melton commending the addition of a judgeship to our circuit. We haven't qualified for just one year. We've actually been five consecutive years with a caseload count of over five judges. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, for example, 5.6 judges. So this is not anomaly or a fluke or a spike for one year. We've had consistently very high uh, caseload. And so we're here asking, uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, Judge Connor uh, actually served as the chair of the uh, uh, caseload, uh, excuse me, the workload assessment committee. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Right. So this is a statistical analysis and it's a weighted analysis based on the number of murders you have compared to the number of child support cases you have. Each clerk reports each of these numbers every year. And so that analysis is very objective. It's conducted by AOC. And uh, they come up with a ranking of the caseload uh, per circuit. And uh, in essence, if you have four judges under their criteria, you must be doing the work of 5.33 judges, as I understand it, in order to qualify to be considered for an additional judge. So we've been over that 5.33 level for four out of the last five years. One year we were, I believe, as the chart will show you, at 5.09 in 2014. So the process is that uh, the uh, Judge uh, Connors Committee uh, determines that you have that case count, and they did that. Uh, they then, upon request of the circuit, uh, report to the uh, Judicial Council and make a recommendation for these two circuits to be approved for a judge. Uh, we went to the, that committee and they voted us out and voted us up, you would say, not put us out, and approved us uh, to be commended to the Judicial Council. We then went to the Judicial Council and uh, 
then Chief Judge Connor was so very gracious at that meeting as to acknowledge that, um, that we had a compelling case for being prioritized. They take two votes in the Judicial Council. One is, are you recommended for another judge? And the second vote is, uh, who should be prioritized? And I'm, I'm very uh, indebted to her for her graciousness and not putting us in a competitive situation, but I, I believe our case might have been compelling. So uh, we're here asking for uh, another judgeship. Uh, all the uh, authorities within my circuit are in accord. The counties have all passed resolutions agreeing to pay their part. The district attorney supports it, the public defender. Uh, our bill in the House, House Bill 28, is sponsored by our entire uh, legislative delegation, and we are fully ready to accommodate another judge, except we're going to have to find a place for her or him to sit. But uh, <laughs> I have a feeling my office will be cut in half, but that's all right. Okay. Where, uh, where do you judges sit right now, in what, all four counties, Judge? Yes, uh, we have a truly randomized case assignment system, as is prescribed by Uniform Superior Court Rule 3. Um, we're, oh, I guess if I can say something humbly, I would s probably suggest our, our case assignment order is, has been used by other circuits. Mm -hmm. it, it is a, it's not a one, two, three, four case assignment system. It's a permutation, so you can't tell by filing a case who the next judge is going to be. Uh, we have very strict rules for making sure there's no manipulation of the judicial assignments, which is um, loathsome. Uh, we have really eradicated judge shopping in our circuit, uh, which I would confess is, uh, is, uh, was a terrible problem, uh, as one judge in the circuit calls it. Um, we had, uh, well, it, it was a bad situation. Okay. And those of you who are lawyers know exactly how that happens, and you know how, um, how damaging that is to the administration of justice and the reputation of the judiciary. So all four judges do both civil and criminal in all four counties. The only exception is that as a chief judge, I assign death cases on a rotating basis, there are, in, there are circumstances under which a judge may not be uh, ready or available for a death mm -hmm. penalty case. And I'm going to open up for questions here yes. for, for the committee in just a second, but I will say to the new committee members, probably almost every session we hear a bill, one or two, sometimes sometimes three, uh, to add the additional Superior Court judges around the state when population demands and case counts uh, indicate that we should do that. We also make sure that it is um, paired with funding uh, in, the, in the governor or the House budget uh, before we try to move those bills on. And it's my understanding that both of these uh, judgeships that we'll hear today are being funded in the governor's budget. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, questions from, for the witnesses from members of the committee, Mr. Whip. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not necessarily a, a question for the witnesses. Uh, I think they've made their case and with the funding uh, already there. Uh, but for uh, the AOC, can uh, y'all get us just a copy of the study? I'd be curious to just see that. So if y'all could just provide that to us, I'd like to see that. Yes, of course. Thank Tyler, you. Tyler, is anything you wanted to add or anybody with your office wanted to come up and tell us about this? You don't have to. I'm just offering. If, if you would like us to explain the process. And, uh, Come on, come on up and give us a real, real no brief, real case brief case on that. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, why don't y'all come, Judge? Would you, you and the representative move over and sure. let those two sit in front of the mics right there? And um, because we have so many new members, um, let's get a brief explanation of how this process works. Because you, as a legislator, have the right to request a study be done, if I understand it correctly. Uh, if you think your judges need one more, um, one more judge, so. Um, Introduce yourself. Welcome. Good to have you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tyler Mashburn, Legislative Liaison for the Judicial Council, Administrative Office of the Courts. Uh, and I'm Tracy Mason, Assistant Director with the Judicial Council, AOC. And uh, thanks for having us up. I know we have some new members, and I appreciate the opportunity to explain our process. Uh, but as a good attorney, I'll defer and be second chair on this matter and let Ms. Mason uh, explain this process. <laughs> thank you. Um, Thank you again for asking us to come up and explain this for the new members that may not know us. Uh, the Judicial Council is the policy-making body for the statewide uh, judiciary. It is, uh, the council is chaired by the Chief Justice, so Chief Justice Melton is currently serving as chair and vice chair is presiding Justice Namias. Um, so within the council is the Judicial Workload Assessment Committee, the standing committee of the council, and each year, and that is the committee that administers the annual caseload reporting, um, collection and analysis, and also administers this process by which looking at the need for additional Superior Court judgeships. So um, I'll just kind of go through the timeline. Uh, over the calendar year, the 
annual caseload reporting uh, takes place January 1st through March 15th, and that is caseload reporting from um, all classes of court. Uh, so that is the case count, the case count data collected through March 15th. Um, April 1st uh, is when the process opens up for um, for courts or judges or legislators to request a um, a study for an additional superior court judgeship. Uh, and by June 1st, that is when that, that process closes. And then th over the next couple of months, that analysis takes place. So any requests that have been received from a chief judge or, or other for a request for an additional superior court judgeship, the analysis takes place. The Standing Committee on Judicial Workload Assessment uh, hears the results of the analysis for any requesting circuit and chooses whether or not to pass on a recommendation for an additional superior court judgeship to the full Judicial Council. Who, who are the people that can initiate that request? That, those you, requests... You mentioned a, a judge. Yes. yes. The, um, anyone may request, um, may request an additional uh, judgeship study so that um, it is... We send notification to the Governor, to the governor General Assembly, Assembly, Superior Court judges, and District Court administrators no later than April 1st. And so that request may come in from, from any individual. So and so... Yeah. Members can request. Okay. Correct. Yes. Absolutely. And any time that a request is received, the chief judge of each circuit is notified. So if you have any questions about the process now, now would be the time to ask you know, if anybody had any questions. Any, yes. Representative Welch. Does the process include a process to look at circuit to determine whether or not the number of judges <coughs> in excess to the reduction in caseload? I do not believe so, no, sir. Any other questions? We got one right here, Representative Lewinsky. Does that look at su just superior courts or all of the courts uh, when it's requested? So the annual caseload process uh, collects data from each class of court, but uh, but this process only applies to superior court judgeships. Any other questions by members of the committee? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> press press the button right here, and I'll turn your microphone. Judge Edwards mentioned the, I, that all four counties had basically agreed to do their pro rata share. Is that something that, was, that is within your process or is that something that is handled outside and then you're basically going to the controlling counties that control the money? That is outside the Judicial Council process. We look at the data and the analysis, and anything right. to do with funding would be outside. Just for the recommendation. Thank you. And then correct. And my suggestion, Judge, is you get your county commissioners lined up and let them know what, they, what you need and get them behind the request. We is that have, right? They've all passed resolutions. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's, that's something before the legislative delegation really wants to jump in and support it. They want to make sure the county commissions want to pay their share of the bill, which in a circuit like ours comes under $100,000. Okay. So they, they were all delighted to have the benefit of the additional help with trying the cases. Uh, Absolutely. Yes, sir. So okay. That's, that's fine. Yes, sir. Any other questions from members of the committee of either one of these two witnesses or representative or judge? All right. Thank you all. We Thank appreciate you. You, you, you being here today. Um, I don't think we have Jordan and anybody signed up, do we? No. Okay. So um, uh, you've heard the uh, testimony uh, and uh, the need for this uh, judgeship on House Bill 28. Is there a motion? Do pass, Mr. Chair. There's a motion do pass. There's a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Any opposed? The bill passes on the rules, Mr. Chairman. Good luck. <laughs> uh, you're very welcome. Judge, thank you for being here. Would Judge, uh, there you Yes, please. Okay, Judge, thank you for coming today. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations. Appreciate y'all being here today. Thank you very much. Okay, Red, Representative Efstration, I think you have a judicial bill for us here today, too. Do you not? House Bill 21? Yes, sir. Go ahead and press the button. <laughs> if you sit up here at the table, you can make a motion to the table. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, why don't you come right around down the corner? Uh, okay, all right. Representative Estration, why don't you tell us about uh, House Bill 21? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. I'll be succinct. I'll try not to rehash some of what we covered previously, but I submitted a letter from the Chief Justice, just Chief Justice Melton, concerning the needs that were referenced with the Griffin Judicial Circuit and then the Gwinnett Judicial Circuit. 
from the data-driven study conducted by AOC, and uh, you all can review that letter. It's in your folders. Additionally, as was discussed, the Gwinnett Judicial Circuit is a one-county circuit, and we have a letter from the commission chair detailing the support that the local government has for the request that you're reviewing here today. Certainly, uh, House Bill 21 is a bipartisan measure uh, with the uh, chairman of the Gwinnett delegation supporting the measure as the second signer. Um, Gwinnett currently is approaching one million in population. Uh, we have significant needs in our judicial system. We're well renowned, uh, very proud to say, and, and it's due to the outstanding work of our judicial officials and staff at our courthouse. We're well renowned for being a very efficient place where cases are moved and um, residents uh, have their needs met in the judicial system. So the 11th Superior Court judge request is made uh, in that vein. We are expanding our courthouse currently, and there's a new wing being built on the courthouse. The governor would have the ability to appoint this new judge to begin service in January of 2020, and there will be space available at that time. I know the space question was discussed, so chambers, courtrooms, staff area, as well as for the DA's office and uh, for other support staff, we uh, do not, we have a independent public defender um, uh, opt-out circumstance, but all support staff necessary uh, has been contemplated and w can be accommodated here with this request. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have witnesses available for the committee today, just as necessary, but um, I'd submit that uh, with the vetting that's been done and, and uh, with the uh, much of the great testimony that was already offered with respect to the Griffin Circuit uh, would ask for the committee's favorable consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, um, Mr. Estration. I um, I know that I was looking, for example, on um, page 3, line 59, the chief judge of the Gwinnett Judicial Circuit shall be elected from among the judges by majority vote of the total number of judges voting. I'm sure, uh, that's, that's currently how the chief judge is selected, correct? Why don't y'all just come on up, judges? Um, you came all the way down here. We might as well let you come up to the mic there for a second. And I guess, um, uh, Legislative Council, the reason we restate that is because we're only changing a number uh, on line 18 and all the rest of this is current law, correct? So, so really all the bill does is change one number on line 18 and restates the current law on how everything else works in the circuit right now. Okay. Judges, please introduce yourself and happy to have you here today. Well, thank mm -hmm. you very much. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to appear in front of the committee. My name is George Hutchinson. I am the Chief Superior Court Judge in Gwinnett County, and Judge Connor, who you've heard some about already, is my immediate predecessor. I'm certainly glad to have her here with us today. I want to start out by thanking uh, Representative Efstration and all the co-sponsors of this bill. I want to also thank him for the very kind words. Uh, we're very proud of what it is that we do in Gwinnett. We think we've got a great circuit and a great group of judges, and we think <coughs> that we do ter uh, terrific things for the community that we serve. We currently have 10 Superior Court judges. We are asking for an 11th. The last Superior Court judgeship was added back in 2008. That's when it became effective, so it would have been approved by the legislature in 2007, so roughly 12 years ago at this point in time. And, of course, over that time, Gwinnett has changed. Everybody, anecdotally, I think, probably that has to drive northbound on 85 can probably attest to that without a whole lot of numbers being thrown around. But best estimates from our county is that we've added over 200,000 people in that period of time. And as Representative Ustration has already told you, by the time that this becomes effective, we're probably pushing up against a million people in Gwinnett County. So the need is certainly there. We certainly appreciate the support that we've gotten from a variety of different uh, organizations and people, not the least of which, of course, is our county. As you've heard, Charlotte Nash, our chairman, has looked at this. We communicate very well with our commissioners. We're proud of that relationship. They're aware of this request and support it. They are prepared to support it financially as well. Um, a couple of things that are important to them, the timing of when this would become effective is important to them in terms of being able to prepare in a budget perspective and, of course, to make sure that we have the space available to actually run those courtrooms whenever it's hopefully approved by this body and signed off on by the governor. As you've heard, the Judicial Council also supports it. Uh, I won't go through that process. You've heard a lot about that, but uh, obviously the numbers justify the uh, request. and. 
just again anecdotally the feel around the courthouse is that we would certainly appreciate the assistance of an additional judge to help us manage the various cases that we've got. One of the things that we did differently that I'm not sure that many others have done is we actually commissioned a uh, study by the National Center for State Courts. They did a study of um, our circuit in 2015. It's a time and motion study. They actually came in, spent a good deal of time with us. Judge Connor was the chief at that time. Uh, did an analysis of need and the amount of uh, work that judges put into actually accomplishing what it is that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Boiling it down to the bottom line, essentially they said that uh, our workload and the things that we did justified about 16.49 judges. So we feel as though we do a very good job of managing uh, the caseload that we have, but we certainly feel as though having an 11th judge would be a tremendous assistance to us. Uh, we think that this is going to help us effectively manage the cases that we've got, uh, get those cases resolved as quickly and efficiently as possible, and once again, hope that we can get your support for this bill. Thank you so much, Jill. We appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah. Chairman, thank you for allowing us to be here. Um, Y'all heard a lot about me already. <laughs> um, I did present at Judicial Council. Um, what I did chair, Judge David Emerson uh, from Douglas actually chairs the Standing Committee on Judicial Workload. Um, I chaired a special committee on examining that time and motion study. Uh, we did that last year and the entire state participated in a time and motion study to make sure that the data was correct. And so for a um, eight week, wasn't it an eight week period, uh, judges across the state actually tracked their time. We did include state court judges in that time and motion study. So going forward now, state court judges will have the opportunity to have access to these time and motion studies as they make presentations to the county commissions statewide seeking to, to have new state court judges. I will tell you all that um, the need I presented at Judicial Council, obviously we qualify under the data-driven study. We qualify, we, we have a need under the state system for over 12 judges and we currently have 10. Uh, Cobb County has 10 judges, DeKalb County has 10 judges, and Gwinnett has 10, and then Fulton, of course, is at 20 right now. Um, the numbers certainly qualify. The other uh, criteria that is special to Gwinnett uh, that impacts our judicial system greatly is, as you all may be aware, we are the, the most diverse county in the state of Georgia. Um, when you look at the numbers, Gwinnett County in 2017, out of the 920,000, we had 195 Hispanic people who self-identified as Hispanic and over 110,000 people who identified as Asian. You can compare that. Fulton County, even though they had a million, their Hispanic population was at 76,000. Cobb's at uh, 99. DeKalb's at 65. We just have a greater number of folks who are of non-English speaking as their first language. We have a constitutional mandate to provide them interpreters. So those of you who are lawyers and been in court, you know that when you translate everything word for word, it takes a little longer. <laughs> I'm mimicking what happens when I have a translator there. Mm -hmm. And so last year we spent over a, um, over half a million dollars providing translators for all the languages that we translated. So that impacts how fast we can move cases, and it definitely um, triggers the need to have more judicial officers. So we appreciate your consideration. We appreciate you allowing us to be here today, and we thank you for your time. Okay. Questions of the witnesses? Representative Bruce? Pull your mic over, Representative. Mm -hmm. Just a uh, quick question. How many different languages do you have to interpret? Last year, we interpreted in about 50 different languages. Wow. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that many existed, but yeah. that's what mm -hmm. we provided. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, 45 languages exactly, uh, $570,000 just in Superior Court translator fees, and then if you com we can have a combined budget, State Superior and Magistrate Court for these things, the total budget across all three of those courts was just shy of $770,000. Other questions from members of the committee for our witnesses? Representative? Um, Judge, can you speak to, um, or anyone else, um, speak to, I know we've had an issue in the past where counties have been tracking, or the, the local um, judicial circuits have been tracking their caseload, um, and uh, later have discovered an error in that calculation. 
Is the standing committee that you that you spoke of before sort of meant to provide a check on that? Is there some some check in the system? What I discovered um, when I was starting chairing the new one is that the standing committee wasn't necessarily doing that check. Obviously, we had the issue that arose last year, and so it brought to the forefront. How this happens is that the cases are reported from the clerk's office to the AOC. It's, a, it's an electronic transfer, and so it requires the clerk's electronic database to speak clearly to the AOC's database. And um, sadly, I'm not sure that there was um, a check. So when the numbers came in, there wasn't a verification procedure. Obviously, after uh, certain things happened, everybody's attention was brought to that matter. In Gwinnett, I can tell you, these caseload studies, these numbers are based on three years of data. We go back three years. In Gwinnett, we had our staff attorneys um, do hand counts along with our clerk. We have um, a little more sophisticated uh, database that's our, um, our clerk's operating system. But just to be sure and to give us confidence when we came up here to the legislature and asked for a new judge and told you this is what our numbers, um, we did a, a hand count of some civil cases in years past and then we did a hand count of all the felony cases to ensure that when the clerk reported that we had this many hundred serious felonies, this many hundred um, regular felonies, that, that we had confidence and faith in that. And so to answer your question, no, this, that standing committee is not auditing that, but I think every court now that is doing that are doing self-audits through their judges and their clerk's office to ensure that this data is correct. It's important we understand mm -hmm. that. Any further questions of our witnesses from members of the committee? Okay. We sort and judges appreciate y'all being you. here with us today. Thank, thank you so you. much we for coming down. Appreciate your time. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Representative Estration, did you have anyone else that you wanted to call up? No, sir. I just asked for the committee's favorable consideration. If uh, there are any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Okay. If we have no further, um, uh, Representative Welch, did you have a question? There is a motion and a second to approve House Bill 21. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? House Bill 21 is passed and moves on to rules. Thank that you. will conclude our agenda for today. I appreciate you all being here, and um, see you later.